All right. So um, thank you so much for joining our leadership development panel discussion series. Uh, this is the first uh, panel discussion, though we've had a few webinars in the past to dissect some of the research that we've done, some of the surveys that a lot of you have participated in. But I'm really excited to open up uh, a series of panel discussions. There are so many interesting topics to talk about when it comes to leadership development. And I've, been a, I've had the pleasure of speaking with a lot of you on this call and, and on this panel about interesting uh, and very important uh, elements to supporting and enabling uh, leaders within our companies, because ultimately uh, it's the people at the companies that are really uh, getting the job done, executing on the vision of top uh, founders and CEOs. So thank you again for, for joining. Uh, today's call will be obviously a panel discussion. We have two key questions that we want each of the panelists to share about from both their personal capacity, perhaps also the experience of uh, their companies, though they, they may not be uh, officially uh, representing the views of, of their organization, uh, but I've listed uh, their country and their, and their company that they're currently uh, working at and really eager to hear their thoughts. And uh, for those not on the panel itself, feel free to uh, post uh, questions or thoughts in the chat. Um, and if you would like to be a part of a future panel, do feel free to, to reach out to me directly and we can uh, discuss what types of topics would be uh, better suited for you and in the company that you represent. So uh, before we get into the fun panel, I did want to give a quick uh, shout out to Coffee Chat. So this is the company behind the panel and we have been uh, operating for over three years now. Uh, we essentially enable companies to make one-on-one -on -one coaching, both professional and peer coaching, a lot more easy to roll out at your companies. Uh, so we've designed a software to do just that. Uh, we've continued to refine it and innovate based on feedback from HR and talent leaders across Africa. Um, and so if anyone is interested in, in learning more, they can always visit our website, www.coffeechat.co. Uh, and also, if you want to book a call to learn more about how we can support your team, uh, you can also just book a call uh, with our team, and we'd be happy to discuss that further. We do have three different types of coaching. We have one-on-one -on -one professional coaching, uh, which essentially allows any of your managers to pick a, co a coach of their choice from our pre-vetted pool of coaches who all have uh, relevant experience across the continent. And we also have an exciting new program we launched this year uh, around peer coaching, which manages, uh, which pairs different managers with each other across different companies. And it's a great way to uh, enable networking, but also developing a coaching mindset since it's a two-way peer coaching conversation each month. And then finally, we also have team coaching where we work with companies to understand some of the crucial conversations and topics that leadership teams need to be having and bringing in relevant experts and coaches to facilitate those group conversations. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to now introduce our esteemed uh, panel. Uh, so we have Cecilia, Queen, Nelly, Tiana Lepo, and Grace, uh, all here coming from uh, almost all four corners uh, of the, the continent. Uh, so really excited to hear the diversity of experiences and um, strategies really to support high potential leaders. This was a topic that I was really um, passionate about. I've been able to access a lot of extra support. I have a lot of privilege, obviously, but also have worked at companies that have really recognized the potential in me. And I've also spoken with a lot of companies that are keen to uh, really uh, identify young leaders and bring them into uh, positions of leadership early because uh, that career uh, experience does really matter. And uh, what we found in our most recent survey uh, was that uh, fast tracking high potential leaders, especially underrepresented leaders, was one of the top reasons why uh, companies would go about sponsoring various forms of coaching uh, for their managers. And so uh, with that, I'd love to have each panelist briefly share uh, you know, where they base their company, what does their company do in, in the role in which they play uh, at that company. Um, so maybe we start from, from left to right as, as the 
uh, panelists appear on the screen here. So Cecilia, um, welcome. Hi everyone, and thank you uh, for having me. My name is Cecilia Gitahi, Head of Learning for Wasoko. Amazing, thank you Cecilia and, and welcome. Thanks so much for your time and, and joining us today. Queen, welcome. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. My name is Queen Kaze. Um, I'm in of the Human Resource Department in Djibouti. My role is across all the operating countries in Djibouti. Now we have eight countries that's, um, that have Djibouti. So yeah, so I extend my support across all the eight countries. Fantastic. Thank you, Queen. And I had recently an opportunity to interview one of your managers on our podcast, The Everyday Leader. Arlington is quite uh, the leader and uh, glad to have heard more about what Chibu yeah. is doing across the region. And uh, Nelly, welcome. Thank you very much, Chris, and good evening, everyone. Really, really good to be uh, part of this. So my name is Nelly Mutula. Um, work for a company called Fuzu. Hopefully most of you know about uh, know about Fuzu. If not, this is the day to do that. So I'm in charge of our people operations function, but also manage our external recruitment uh, business, business unit that covers East Africa and West Africa and slowly getting into South Africa. So looking forward to the discussion that we'll have today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Nelly. And uh, Tione. Hello, everyone, and hi, Chris. It's great to see everyone on the call. Pretty excited about listening in and learning in myself. So my name is Tione. Uh, Tione Le Ponjovu is my full name. As you heard, uh, Chris actually called me Tione, so I usually uh, shorten it like that. Feel free to call me like that as well. Um, I am at World Vision and a manager for learning and development, which also covers performance management and uh, staff well-being. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us from Zambia. And Grace, welcome. Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to meet uh, my fellow panelists. As you already know, my name is Grace. I currently work with Simless HR, and Simless HR is um, a it's basically a software development. I mean, built software platforms that enable different companies across Africa to you know uh, maximize their human resources processes and just generally make their businesses more efficient and more productive. At Simless HR, I am the head of human resources, and I'm basically responsible for um, crafting and delivering strategies to optimize our performance across all our human resources functions. So I'm looking forward to the session today. Thank you so much, Grace. Welcome, everyone. And uh, as you can see, if you're not a part of the panel, this is quite a wide ranging uh, cross section of kind of high growth uh, and impactful companies and organizations uh, with, a, with a footprint across Africa. So I'm sure there's a lot of interesting insights when it comes to today's topic. So let's uh, dive right in. Like I mentioned, uh, this idea of fast tracking high potential leaders. I think, you know, yes, uh, leaders uh, are not necessarily born, and but they can be made. But I think we can all say that, you know, we, it's, it's can sometimes be straightforward. We find leaders who are maybe relatively young or maybe haven't been appreciated and we want to find ways to uh, grow them within our organization, support them, and harness their full potential. And I know, having worked at a number of different countries or in a number of different countries that in a number of different companies, that each company has different approaches uh, at, with with varying successes. And I'd love to really uh, dive into this and hear from each of you um, in what ways uh, does your organization or company identify high potential and underrepresented leaders, and then accelerate their growth. Um, and so maybe for, for the first question, we'll go from left uh, to right as we introduce each other. And then the second question will go back the other way. Uh, so Cecilia, do you want to uh, kick us off and tell us more about how um, your company identifies and uh, supports high potential and underrepresented leaders? Um, thanks, Chris. And 
I, I think a good place to start uh, in this conversation is probably define what high potential is, because I guess that's very contextual uh, to your organization. So I'll be speaking as a head of L&D for Wasoko. And for us, how we define a high potential employee is that employee who has exhibited the skills and the behaviors that align with our culture and uh, our values as an organization. And so um, how we've gone about identifying is we started by um, aligning or identifying what are the key skills and competencies that help define success for us as, as Wasoko. And we identified uh, three major skills. And one of them is collaboration because collaboration now helps us understand, can you work with a team? How able are you to work uh, with others? And this is also in line with our values as an organization, which is we win together. So in order for you to be, to be successful within Wasoko, you must be really good at collaborating and working with others. Uh, the other uh, skill that is really critical for our organization is tolerance for ambiguity. Because I can tell you, uh, Chris, that the, the project you're doing in December is not the project that you did in January. It's not the project you did uh, in June. And so when you're given a new project, you can't say that I'm going to take a week to study the lay of the land because there's no lay of the land uh, for you to study because we are a, an organization that is growing extremely fast. So in order for you to be successful, you must have that tolerance for ambiguity. You must be ready to go in there and actually define that lay of the land, draw what that looks like, and be able to chart your, 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 your path moving forward. Then the third and final skill that helps um, you uh, become a high potential or perform extremely well within Wasoko is uh, learning agility. And this is again is in line with even one of our values, learn and grow. So learning agility is basically and in a nutshell, your willingness and ability to learn new skills and even learn from your experiences. Now, coming back to your question of how do we identify high potential employees? I must say that initially we were identifying high potential employees uh, based on performance for example if your performance on on our performance evaluation was 3.5 and above then you are defined as a high potential but with time we've come to realize that that is not necessarily the case you may be a high performing uh, employee but not necessarily a high potential so we were fusing those two terms potential and performance and you will find that, like I said, somebody who is performing uh, very well will not necessarily be a high potential. So without even reinventing uh, the wheel, we looked out at research that has been done in terms of how do you define a high potential within organization. And we based our identification of these elements from research that has been done by reputable organizations and that is what we have adapted at Wasoko. So in order for you to be uh, classified as or to be selected as a high performing uh, employee, you must have aspiration to be successful or aspiration to grow in your role. And this is where I want to uh, help us understand the difference between a high potential and a high performing employee. Because you can have a high performing uh, employee who has no aspiration of growing beyond where they are. They're very comfortable as, a, as an individual contributor. And so for, for a high uh, potential uh, 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 employee within Wasoko, you must have the aspiration to grow. Then the other um, evaluation or assessment we do we are, we, are, we are doing is ability in terms of skills and competencies for you to perform effectively at a senior role. And then finally, the other uh, element that is using us to assess uh, high performing individuals is your engagement. In other words, do you see Wasoko as a good place or a good organization in order for you to grow 
and achieve your personal and professional aspirations. So that is how we are going about um, identifying high potentials. You can see we've transitioned from just looking at, at uh, performance, which is a good place to start, but looking at these other three elements, which is um, uh, your level of, of engagement, your ability, and also your aspiration to grow. Wow, that, that was really powerful. Um, there was a lot of gems there that, that we can't really even begin to unpack. Uh, I think some of my uh, takeaways, though, will be this comfort with ambiguity. I think that's so important. I've seen that time and time again in terms of uh, this high potential leaders being able to really be comfortable with pivots. Uh, and, and companies are definitely pivoting a lot these days as they adapt to, to do uh, macroeconomic climates uh, and other realities. And I also really like what you you said there in terms of the differentiation between high potential and high performing, and, and that can be that can have implications on how you invest in talent development um, in different ways. So thank you so much, Cecilia, for for sharing that wisdom. Next is Queen. Yes. Um, uh, as I was listening to Cecilia, I could hear some similarities, and I believe what Sopa is also it's a SMEs. This is the same level where Dribble is. So where we have a small team, we keep them challenged uh, and we keep adding um, duties and responsibilities to them. But also we need to make sure that, okay, are we just, are we only adding responsibilities on the team or are they really highly um, qualified to do the, to, to perform well on their job? So um, specifically for Jibu and also not to repeat, what Cecilia have, have mentioned. So we, we, we have actually by, from this year, we have realized that, okay, so if we have a small team, if we also seeing uh, we have some high potential in the team, how can we make sure that um, the criteria that we are using to, to identify the high, um, high potential employees is not just uh, the managers who we, have, who we work with the person and then that's it. They will come and say so and so should be, should be promoted in the next at uh, six months so we have we keep the performance reviews um is 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 the old model but we are trying to make it to reinvent it and make sure that they are really efficient so in the performance review we have of course the achievement is the person um the competence of the person what did he achieve in the last in the last six months or one year and then we also that is the part where just is the, per, uh, is the supervisor and the employee. We have also included a percentage for the employee to be um, to be um, entitled or to be considered in the, in the people who will be uh, promoted in the next few months. We are also looking at the 360 feedback. So what are other people talk, uh, saying about this person? So that's, that's the same thing, so like the personality. Okay, does he stand out only in his role? Does he stand out only as, as a salesperson or does also other people who interact with him, the collaborations, um, what is his attitude, the behavior, etc. So the 360 feedback, we do it once in a year and then there's a percentage, um, so to say, for you to be um, eligible for, um, as, uh, 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 for a promotion or to, um, to raise on a, on a leadership role. So there is that part. There is also the number of hours you spend on development as, as an employee. So we look at that. Uh, so every month, um, start the, the direct report and their supervisors agree on the, there's a minimum hours for development. We agree that, yes, we overload them, but also uh, what do they do uh, outside of working? Or do we really uh, ensure that they spend some time to develop themselves? So every month they, they have a commitment to, to do development and and uh, and uh, and then we will assess the hours spent on development and what is the outcome uh, so if it was presentation skills do we really see some improvement or was this did you just open a course online and then and then that's it so um, we we have those three major criteria that we look at and one more thing that we are we are adding and um to also not make sure that okay we are not waiting uh, and then by december we say oh by the way this person should be promoted or okay maybe he's missing one of those but he still really have potential we are we have internal coaching um and then also i'm, uh, I'm going to, to partner with copy chat very soon for the team to have external um, exposure also with other leaders so we have internal coaching this is a process this is something we've been doing for for a very 
for, for the last two years now, where they meet with a senior, um, a senior manager in, in, in Djibouti. So it's, it's more like a matching from the junior and senior manager. Um, they spend at least, tw um, they meet twice in a month to discuss just the person, we just make sure that I don't report to you, she doesn't report to me and there is no really direct um, reporting line. And, and, and we coach them. So that's also another person identify the potential and then we come and reach out to HR and say, by the way, this person is still have uh, maybe a long way, but there is, there is potential from um, on the staff. So those are the two uh, methods that we use, the two big methods, so the performance review with uh, major uh, three criteria, and then also uh, using the matching, the coaching um, method to support uh, leaders, potential leaders within the team. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Queen. And I really um, uh, enjoyed the point uh, that you were making around the 360 element of feedback, because uh, you really need to have multiple eyes on people because the, the direct supervisor may not be positioned or maybe they, they have some blind spots to really um, identify that high potential uh, leadership. So I think that's super important. And then the element of making sure it's not just, you know, biannual uh, reviews and it's too late to promote someone because there is some uh, significant gap that needed more attention. And also happy that uh, Jibu will be soon uh, engaging with the, the peer coaching program with some of your managers. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, Nelly, um, tell us more about how Fuzu uh, identifies its high potential leaders. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. And I would say, um, as I was listening to Cecilia and Queen, we definitely do have a lot of similarities. So one of the things for us that we uh, definitely did uh, when we started having high growth was really sit down and figure out what are the competencies of a good leader. Uh, and this was not focused on the hard skills. So it's not what you do in your job, but actually the softer side of um, of a person. Um, and that's quite similar to what Cecilia has mentioned. So I won't go through, uh, through that. But then once we identified that, the other thing that we did was we then now introduce different ways of once we identify, okay, this is what we want our potential leaders to be like or our potential superstars uh, to be like, then we figured out how do, I, how do we then accelerate their growth. So some of the things that we have done is one, uh, introduce this into our recruitment process. So even as we are going out looking for, say, a sales uh, person or a business development manager, we look out for not just the ability to be able to perform in the role, but then do they have potential for them as we grow, as we scale, because we are a high growth business, as we scale, as we grow, where they have potential to be able to lead a team or even participate in strategic discussions. So that's the first thing that we do. Then once you come in, uh, you, of course, have an onboarding process that focuses on your role and all these different things, but we try to leverage a lot on the potential that the person has. So one of the the other things that we have done is of course making sure that we have clear accountability for everyone because you cannot be a high potential without performing at the end of the day so you have to be performing so making sure that everyone has clear okrs um, that guide them in terms of knowing okay if i do this or if i hit this or if i uh, get to this mesh of success, I'm actually performing really, really well. And from that, then now we can be able to uh, to accelerate their growth. The other thing that we are doing is ensuring that we have clear career paths for people. Of course, it's not everyone that will be able to grow uh, that way. And that then we focus a lot of this on the potential leaders that we see um, in our business. So the career paths uh, focus a lot on making sure that you're exposed to the different areas in which you can be able to grow within the business, even as we, um, as we grow. Then the other thing that we are doing is ensuring that our managers are there to support the team. Because you cannot have... Um, high potential people who do not have the guidance. So we have created a ratio between manager and um, uh, reportees that is to a specific limit. So for us, it's between five to seven people. So as a manager, you cannot have more than that. So then you're focused uh, really on ensuring that the people you have in your, in your team get the right support, not just to do the job, but also uh, to grow in their career. Um, the other thing that we have created is uh, room for feedback. And feedback is uh, introduced into our um, by annual reviews. So we have the informal feedback, but then outside of that, we do have regular informal feedback sessions between peers. So your peer can be able to give you feedback in terms of something that you did or something that you, they are probably identified in you that would be good for you to expose yourself more, uh, more into. Um, but then the other thing that comes with that is it gives you room for you to voice out, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, it gives you room for you to voice out things uh, before they 
rather than having to wait until six months for you to do a performance uh, review. Then for our more junior uh, team members who at the end of the day, they wouldn't, wouldn't know where to start and where to uh, move to. So we have created something that we call 80-20. So 80-20 is, 80 is your core job, and then 20% is room for you to be able to explore different other businesses or business units or functions within the organization, organization and identify where you want to grow to um, and get the support of that specific manager. So it also allows you to work with a different manager from the person that you um, interact directly with. And similar to Queen, we have also then uh, provided the team with mentorship and um, uh, mentorship from the senior leaders, but also from peers. So high potential leader would uh, potentially get a chance for them to manage a team within their function without necessarily having full management responsibility. So it allows you to exercise that muscle of uh, leading people and guiding people without necessarily the, the, the pain of having to figure out how to ensure this person is doing good um, in their job. And then uh, the last part of it is, of course, then making sure that um, we, of course, like providing learning solutions for those who want to be able to uh, to grow and uh, improve in their career. So, yeah, that's mainly what we do at Fuzu. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Nelly. A lot of great points there as well. I think uh, two of them, uh, one, one really around um, hiring people for their growth potential, not a perfect fit for their role, but will they be able to grow? Because you, know, you, you don't wanna to have to hire people over people. You'd rather have them be able to grow and hire people underneath them generally. Uh, obviously there are other cases, but, and then the second one was really being intentional about that manager to uh, team member ratio. Cause I've seen you know, it being three to one or even 12 to one. And it, you know, it really matters in terms of how you're setting up those direct reports for success. Are you giving them enough one-on-one -on -one check-in time, uh, for example, uh, on their personal development. So thank you so much for sharing on that. And uh, we are next going to talk about uh, with Tiana, Tiana Lepo. Um, will you share also what uh, is happening at World Vision Zambia? Hi. Um listening to what everyone else was saying i would resonate with uh, the strategies that are put in place in terms of identifying high potentials but one other thing that um, i would like to narrow into to narrow down into is uh, talking about um kind of like uh giving the managers the responsibility for uh, staff development and particularly uh, developing of their of their teams so if you if you think about how hr works in general and specifically performance development the understanding from managers would be that the responsibility is upon HR, so the onus is on HR to, 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 to come up with the, the goals, to, to track the goals, and at the end of the day, to be able to facilitate the appraisals. Uh, so one of the things that um, generally every organization should be thinking about is empowering their managers to have the ownership of uh, especially performance management. And when a manager understands that this is my responsibility and my role, it becomes easier for either learning and development or uh, HR to track and to work with that manager. So the most important things when I think about it and, and, and when we are talking about being able to identify would be um, empowering the managers themselves. These are the line managers, empowering the, man the, the line managers with the tools and the skills to be able to identify uh, the, the high potentials and um, to be able to identify the high potentials and to know what to do when they identify the, the, the high potentials. Uh, by doing so, it, it now brings the process more uh, personal. It brings the process more personal and it, uh, it, it helps to hold the managers accountable 
I have, uh, I have heard in some organizations and also sometimes in World Vision where it has become part of the KPI of the manager to, um, uh, on how they are performing in line with the performance of their team and the staff development of, uh, of their team. Uh, so I have learned over time that when the, uh, the concept of performance management is left with HR to drive, because HR may not have complete visibility with everybody in the organization, we do experience a number of gaps. And, and sometimes it's very easy for you to miss out uh, on identifying who the potentials are. But when you have a team of people whom we are calling managers, who are spearheading the staff development, who are spearheading the process of identifying who my potentials are, it becomes much easier because these are the people that they are working with on a day-to-day -day basis. So because I am working with these people, because I'm working with these people, because I'm working with these teams on a day-to-day -day basis, it actually automatically means that I, I, I have visibility and I, I can see what is happening. So uh, linking um, and supporting the managers, that would be one in terms of being able to identify high potential. Another thing that um, I think it's uh, either Nelly or Cecilia who mentioned about, about was the concept of having the 360 feedback. I know it's almost impossible to uh, talk about performance management and uh, staff development in general without talking about the bias that may that will exist. So biasness, um, unconscious biasness especially, does exist. And to try and uh, curb that, what we want is to balance it out. What we want is to make sure that we give a fair opportunity to every person in the organization. So um, the concept of uh, being aware of uh, unconscious biasness and bringing in the aspect of uh, 360 feedback would be the second thing. And the third thing is giving the ownership uh, to the staff themselves. Something which is very critical, I, uh, I believe. Um, as staff, uh, I, I know that from the different uh, people who, are, who, who continuously work with, with staff, you have different categories on uh, how staff will express themselves, especially when it comes to their own development sometimes. Uh, some of my experience actually I've learned that some staff are comfortable in their positions, right? So you find that you have a manager who wants to, and, and in this case, it would be this uh, staff who is high performing. Uh, so they are high performing staff, they're meeting their targets and, 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 and they are, uh, on point on uh, all the different objectives that we've that we've set as a manager you have plans for that staff you want that staff to um uh, uh, you want that staff to grow you want that staff to move from one level to the other however um it is important for you to engage with that staff and find out where they are placed in terms of their development so i've learned from engagement that some staff are comfortable where they are. And as leaders, we should be able to, to identify and appreciate uh, when a staff says, I'm comfortable where I am. And I'm not really looking at uh, being elevated in the organization. Uh, well, how can you help me where I am and where I am comfortable? So it's very important to have that engagement, talk about aspirations. So some, uh, some staff will be, uh, highly um, inspired to move up the ladders and to grow themselves, but others may not. They may be slow at that. So it's important for not only managers, but also HR to respect where the staff is. If they say, I'm comfortable where I am, and, and it's okay. The question that we should be asking all the time is, how can we work together? So we don't have to look at ourselves as bringing the solutions. We have to look at ourselves as conduits to discuss 
what solutions and look at what is already working for the staff or the team. Let me, let me actually say the team because it's not only the staff, but also the manager. What is working and how can we improve what is working because we are looking at our continuous improvement. Thanks very much. Thank you so much uh, for, for touching on all those topics. I think you were also getting ahead to the que second question, which we're also going to dig a little bit deeper into shortly around uh, empowering staff to take uh, leadership development into their own hands. But what I really liked uh, on what you shared was this idea of uh, empowering managers to uh, support their teams uh, and then also really um, acknowledging that not everyone uh, is necessarily wanting to grow their careers in the same way, that there's different ways to grow. Some people are comfortable in their current roles. Uh, as long as they don't want salary increases, that's fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so thank you so much for sharing. And then uh, let's hear from Grace also about uh, how Seamless HR identifies high potential and underrepresented leaders at its uh, company. Thank you, Chris. And um, I mean, it was amazing listening to this other four ladies talk about you know, what they're doing at their various organizations. Um, I will address the question on two levels. So the first level is on an organization-wide level, and then the second level is on a manager level. And I'll start with the two key words in the question, which is one, to identify, and the second is to accelerate. So for us at Sinus HR, how do we identify? It actually starts from recruitment. And our recruitment is done um, on two levels. So you have the technical uh, assessment, which basically tests a candidate's um, job knowledge and competence when it comes to the actual work itself. But then there's the other part of it, which we call the self-star value fit interview, where we're assessing a candidate based on our own core values and what we have defined as our corporate culture. And coincidentally, um, the first institutional value for us on our culture deck is actually high performance, high potential. So we have, <laughs> yes, it is. So we, we, we have crafted questions that actually help us to identify candidates who match our institutional values, as well as you know, the non-negotiable individual values that we expect every Simster to have. Um, Simsters, the Simster is uh, a nickname for a similar HR employee. So um, it starts on that level. And for us, it's more important that you, you, know, you, you fit in with the culture in as much as you're good technically, because where you what you lack in technical competence can be plugged in with training and other intervention um, um, or other interventions. But what you lack in, in attitude or behavior and culture fits may just never be, you know, can you just might never be able to plug it in and may have caused more damage than good in the long run. So for us, it starts with recruitment, how we, you know, the questions we ask, the responses, and we're able to fill that through those responses to get, you know, genuine answers. And um, from there, if for any reason we miss it at the point of hiring, we have a probation period which enables us to check in on those things. We're still looking at how good you are with the quality of your work, how well do you know your job, how well do you manage your timeline. But more importantly, we're looking at how you've aligned with what we deem as important to us as an organization. So at the point of um, the confirmation appraisal, we place more emphasis on the behavioral assessment, which is looking at your potential as a leader um, um, or as, I mean, your potential as a future leader in, in the organization. And what are key things we're looking at in that instance? We're looking at how well you exercise judgment. Can you make decisions? Whether they end up, you know, good or bad, are you just able to make a decision when there is a need to? Can you fill in the gap when your line manager is not there? Can you interact with senior colleagues? You know, can you hold the fort? Can you take initiative? Are you responsible? Would you do what you're supposed to do when no one is looking, you know, without being told to? Are you proactive? How well do you 
carry your team members along? Do they even look up to you, you know, to answer some questions that they may not be able to ask their line manager? So those are some of the things that we look at during the probation period. And again, the emphasis is placed more on the soft part of it, such that, you know, it, it actually carries 70% of the entire weight. Oh, anything uh, anything that is not... Um, Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, so that's that on, on the organization wide level in terms of you know identifying these candidates or employees, depending on you know where they are in in, in the process of joining us. Um, that's how we actually identify their leadership potential. When we bring it down to the management level at this point, they're now, you know, employees, confirmed, full-time staff of similar HR. It now comes down to the manager, and that's where I, I, I align with what um, Tiona said. A lot of times, HR would not know what is going on across the organization. I mean, imagine you're just in one location, then not to think of you being in Kenya, Ghana, South Africa, you know, you, you, you have to depend on your line managers. And that's where... You, you need them to actually, um, that, that, that's, that's where the, the acceleration starts from. And how do you even accelerate? So for us at Simulus HR, we don't do promotions based on tenure. The fact that you've stayed here one year, two years, doesn't mean you're going to get promoted because you, you know, spent that much time. But we're looking at how well have you taken on responsibilities. I can remember if it was Cecilia or Queen who had talked about agility because, you know, it's, it's, it's sad, things move fast, and we tend to move fast and break things and they fix as we go along. So nobody's ever going to wait for you. If, if, you, if we need to wait for you for a year to know whether you have the potential, then there's a problem already, right? Because um, that means you, you're just not as agile as you should be probably in delivering your, your tasks. So we're, we'll be relying on managers to see, to you know, to give employees responsibilities, additional responsibilities, let them make mistakes, let them learn as they make mistakes. I'll give you an example. A member of my team tried to reach me yesterday, wanted me to um, review their email, and they just couldn't reach me. And this was an email they wanted to send to a top executive in the company. And eventually when I called them, they're like, oh, Grace, you've killed me today. I'm like, what happened? I wanted to send an email. I needed you to look through it. I'm like, yeah, but is that the same email you sent? I've seen the email. I was like, yes, I eventually had to send it like that. I'm like, but well, you did well. So at least that employee knows how to communicate. You know, tomorrow, if Grace is not there, they can run the show. So you need managers to be able to trust their employees to a certain extent, push them, push certain kinds of responsibilities their way, if they make a mistake, they make a mistake. How do you handle mistakes? How do you, how do you, you know, handle correction? If, if, what kind of environment are you creating? Is it an environment where if you make a mistake, just know that your neck is on the line, you probably lose your job? Or is it one where, you know, okay, it's a learning curve for everyone. I hope we've learned. Let's not make that same mistake again, because that's where learning actually takes place. Um, also, in terms of performance reviews, we've been doing this informally and, um, Right now, we're just actually doing it formally and in a structured way. But um, what we are looking to achieve through regular monthly performance reviews is, is a situation where managers are able to actually identify people who have um, people on their team who have, you know, performed well. And when I say performed well, I don't mean just as a as one person. It's not a one man show. We believe very much in teamwork, and that has also defined the kind of performance management system we have adopted as a company, which is OKRs. So everyone has to pull their way together. But as an, as an individual, I'm looking for areas where I think, OK, you may need to improve upon, and I'll develop a PDP for you. But if I see that you know, you, you're, you're good, you've ticked most of the boxes, and I think you can actually do more to prepare you for the next level of your responsibility, I'm preparing um, an IDP for you. It's like an individual development plan, not, not because you're a poor performer, but because I've identified your willingness to take on more responsibility, your agility, 
you know, your ability to learn from your mistakes, your ability to make judgment calls when there is a need to, your ability to take the initiative and just do what you need to do without being told. So that's where that, that's where we accelerate at a manager level. And to help everyone, at least we we we, we currently sign up all our employees on LinkedIn Learning. So you have the, and learning takes place on three levels. So you have the company wide learnings, which is the learning parts that human resources curates for all employees. So these are soft skills that we want all employees to have, or this is a knowledge that everybody should, you know, have. And then you have the team level one, which is the responsibility of the line manager, because like Tiona said, you are interacting with these people on a day-to-day -day basis. You know their gaps. So because of that, you should be able to create um, curate a learning path that will help them grow. And then thirdly, you have the individual who is responsible for their own learning. And maybe I'll just stop here because that may tie into the second question of this discussion. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, you shared uh, a lot of great points and uh, also some uh, really great examples of how you're putting that into place. And I like the idea of having everyone on LinkedIn learning, everyone on individual development plans so that they are really focused on uh, continual, continual growth. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, I think we, we heard from everyone, yes. So we're gonna go back the other direction. So I'm gonna put you back on the spot, Grace, and let you tell us a little bit. Um, I know we have 10 minutes left, so I guess we'll have to do a quick fire uh, to make sure we can hear from all five of us uh, on how, you know, within the organization do, uh, oh, wrong question. Uh, second question is how do junior and middle managers proactively seek out opportunities uh, and take self-ownership of their leadership development plan. So kind of maybe one is uh, maybe one key way or maybe um, two if, if, if they're quick on how junior and middle managers um, broadly or even within your company can really uh, take self-ownership of their growth. All right, thank you. So very quickly, I would say that um, as a team member, whatever level you are on, you know the dynamics of your team, and if you, have, if you work in an organization that is as transparent um, and has a culture of communicating with employees like Simulus HR does, you have a very good knowledge of where the company is from top to bottom. And as such, you have an idea of the gaps on the company-wide level and how those gaps translate to gaps for your team. Having identified those gaps, you should be able to step up to your line manager or whoever you're reporting to to say, these are the challenges that I see that we have, and this is what I think we can do. But I would like to go, you know, maybe attend a training, or I have attended a training, and that's you being proactive, that's a potential leader right there saying, I have actually read on this, researched on this, or, you know, trained on this, and I think I can, we, can we try, you know, X, Y, Z, out by, by just even seeking out the gaps, that's not called them problems, the gaps or challenges, and trying to find a way to you know, bridge those gaps. That is one way you can you know, um, seek out or take ownership for your development. So you, you've seen the gap and it's, it, it, it's a journey. It's a, how did they say, it's a, it's a sprint, not a marathon. So with that, your line manager can plan with you to say, okay, at the end of this quarter, to be able to do this, you would have read X, Y, Z, or tried your hands on this project, that project, you know, and I think that's one good way. Another way is when a recruitment opportunity comes, particularly within the team. I have experienced this personally. Um, you have team members who say, you know what, I know we want to recruit for this position, but I'm actually interested in that field or in that um, career path. Would it be possible for me to, you know, have, develop a plan to upskill me so that I'm able to fill that gap within the next maybe one month, six weeks, you know, whatever the timeline is that is feasible and also acceptable for the company's goals, you know. Um, I think those are two ways by which you, you can, you know, seek out those opportunities and, yeah, drive your own development. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Grace. And it was great to hear of all the strategies uh, being used uh, at Seamless HR. So next we have uh, Tina Lepo, right? Tiona, uh, I think you're still on mute. Hi. Uh, 
Okay, great. Thanks very much. So I would say the key is guidance. And the question focuses on how the junior managers, junior or middle managers uh, can proactively seek the opportunities. And because of the way we have phrased the question, we kind of like give the, uh, we, we throw it back to, to them to say, identify the opportunities. Uh, but think about it this way. The first time that you took up a leadership role, so you're coming from operational and you're just graduating to go into a leadership role, uh, what are the statistics around your success levels? Uh, speaking from experience, and I know most of the uh, managers who may be on the call, and just generally, we find ourselves not uh, reaching up to 50% of the success that we we, uh, we we think we can reach. So we are, we are usually below the 50%. And the reason is because as line managers or the, as the leaders who are currently existing, we make an assumption that the people that we are leading know that they have to seek out the opportunities. And, and that is something that I try by all means, every time I'm even interacting with leaders, quench that out of your mind. When you have a team, assume they don't know what they need to do and they don't even know where those opportunities are. And that's why I said your key is guidance. The, because you, you have to look at these, uh, um, you have to look at the stuff that are operational as not, uh, um, not having all the information and you are the one who has to provide the information and that's where the guidance now comes in it's up to us to hold the hands of the team members and walk them through it help them identify the opportunities show them where the opportunities are i like what uh grace was saying with regards to i think she was the one who was talking about uh, making sure that everybody is on a linkedin learning and and making sure that the platforms are available for learning uh so show them and direct them where the opportunities are and like that with your guidance they will be able to now take that proactive action because you are you you are literally leading them in the way that um, uh, in the way that they should follow uh, a follow through in terms of how do I think about it when I want to to, to move from uh, being operational to a manager's uh, position. So I'm going to end here for the uh, 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 in the interest of time, and uh, yeah, allow others to also come in. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much. I like the point around kind of you can lead them to water. You know, if they drink, that's up to them. <laughs> Um, so Nelly, we'd yeah. love to hear also from you. Perfect. Um, thank you. And I would say definitely resonate with uh, what Grace and Tiona have mentioned. Um, so I won't dig into that more. Uh, but I think for, for and this is not just focusing on how we do it at Fuzo, but generally for anyone who wants to grow into, um, into a leader, of course, the first thing that you have to be able to have is personal career development goals. There's no way someone will tell you what you need to do for you to advance in your career only you have to also be able to say okay fine i know my manager mentioned this as the goals or uh, development areas i need to be focusing on but then outside of that i also have these ambitions as an individual for me to advance in my career so having that and creating a way in which you can be able to measure that regularly with your manager with your peers with your friends so this goes outside of the organization it doesn't always have to be in the organization itself so that's the first thing I would say everyone would need to have. Uh, the second thing is um, measure your success and uh, progress regularly. And as uh, Tiana said, you have to be able to own this. So it's not everyone who is interested in growing. Some people are okay uh, being an average performer. So anyone who is um, has that ambition for them to be better than what they are currently doing right now would want to have these conversations with uh, their managers, with different other leaders uh, within the organization. So you have to be willing to expose yourself and generally ask for feedback as well. Ask, what am I doing well? What can I uh, do better? What do you think I should be able to do? And sometimes even proactively giving solutions for problems that the business is, uh, is facing, which I think it's something that Grace maybe uh, mentioned. The third thing that I will point out is be involved. 
you know, so you cannot come in and just do the job and assume things are going to work out and Fuzu, sh uh, Fuzu people should be able to see that I'm actually my doing my job well and they should be able to reward me for that. You need to create a way for you to stand out. I know it's not the correct thing to say as, as a HR leader, but at the end of the day, creating visibility for yourself also does help you advance um, as well. And this comes with having as well a personal brand. It's not just about the job that I'm working in, but do I have a personal brand outside of where I'm working and what I do? So who do people know me outside? Because growth doesn't always have to happen internally. It can also be externally as well. So having a personal brand allows people to know who you are. And this is then where we recruiters come in, where we can potentially put you for a leadership opportunity that is outside of your own organization. So create a personal brand for yourself. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Delhi. And Queen, uh, we'd love to hear from you as well. Um, so I think Delhi uh, has really spoke my mind and I won't go so deep or so much deep on that. So the first thing for managers uh, is to assess, yes, the abilities to assess the social skills, to assess the drive from each employee. So people are different uh, and the growth plan is really different. So the moment you have assessed that, you can now come up with a development plan with each person. And as she said, some, some people will grow internally, others will grow externally, or even internally, but in another department. So, yeah, so guide the team, uh, take them through uh, around what, uh, what are all the opportunities they can have within the company. And then also, by the time is to transition out. So, yeah, it is, it is what it is, and, it, uh, and maybe that's what makes sense for for that particular person. So yeah, I won't go so much on that one, but I would say like assess your team, uh, give them a growth plan. How does it look like internally? And then um, help them also to transition out if it is if it is what is best for them. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you, Queen. And uh, Cecilia, can you close us out with some uh, wise words <laughs> on how Wasoko is uh, letting its staff proactively seek out opportunities. No pressure. And I'm sure no, you I have think, great ideas. I think, yeah, yeah. Most of the things have actually been said. I think the only thing I'd want to add is um, if you want to take charge of your uh, leadership growth, one of the things you need to do is take up stretch assignments. And I'll give you an example of how that is looking at, at, at Wasoko. And then it's in line with something that Nelly has said. Because when you, we, 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 are, we are opening a, te, a tech hub in Zanzibar, and this tech, uh, tech hub required uh, people to volunteer uh, to go and establish and set it up. So for those people who actually did take up that opportunity, it's giving them a leadership uh, opportunities to lead teams. And it's also giving them visibility, like Nelly has said. So I think one of the ways of taking ownership of your own leadership growth is uh, just take up stretch assignments that become available uh, within your organization. And then finally, as LND, I keep saying, uh, just keep learning, learning new skills, learning from experience, because you can never learn uh, too much. And that's going to propel you in terms of your, of your growth and uh, your capability and your competencies. So keep learning and also develop as you're learning, develop your soft skills like empathy, I think we all know that after COVID, one of the key skills of leadership today is empathy and uh, emotional intelligence. And these are skills that can be developed by each one of us. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Cecilia. That was a great way to uh, cap off the, the conversation. I've really enjoyed hearing from all the panelists uh, about their experience, their thoughts, the strategies that the teams use, and, and just general um, strategies. And I'll be writing some recap blog articles. So you can also kind of uh, synthesize some of the, the points here. Uh, and I really appreciate everyone's time. I know I learned a lot. I hope the, the uh, audience learned a lot, and even the panelists learn from each other and the spirit of, of peer coaching. So uh, thank you again. We'll be hosting another panel discussion uh, with a new panel uh, on a different topic related to leadership development in three weeks from today. Uh, so keep an eye out for, for that on our weekly blog uh, and also on our LinkedIn page. Thank you again for your time. I know we're a couple minutes late, uh, but I really appreciate 
everyone's uh, time. We'll be posting this uh, on on um, our our uh, page, our YouTube page, the recording, so you'll also be able to access that at a later point. So thank you again. Thank you, Chris. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.